You're listening to Off to Market with Scott Farley and Hamish Chadwick. I'm Scott. And I'm Hamish. And this week we have Lisa Holovnia. Lisa is a music education professional and she's run a successful teaching business, teaching students. I think, is it French horn, Lisa? All the brass, yeah. All, all brass, okay. I'm a French horn specialist and trumpet specialist. And as part of that journey, she had some students that were struggling with braces and dental work or even just general pain when playing these instruments and she's come up with an amazing little invention called Buzz Buddy. So Lisa, do you want to tell us the story and how you got onto Buzz Buddy and how you've got it to where it is now? Yeah, sure Hamish. Um, basically I had a student who had braces and she was an A plus student and she was uh, wanting to be a professional musician so she came one day with braces and I think her family and herself had no idea the impact it would make on her and uh, she was in agony because of the pain because when you put a trumpet mouthpiece against your lips when you've got braces on it cuts the inside of your mouth so um, I thought well what can I do to help this poor girl and um, so I came up with the idea of Buzz Buddy and um, anyway years later she's at the con and she's doing incredibly well and I think she's topping the year at the moment so yeah that's fantastic like that's another really good example of uh where necessity is the mother of invention. Absolutely. And uh, you've seen a problem and you're in the field, which I find is always one of the best areas or one of the best areas for ideas to come out of where someone's in the field, they're an expert in the field and they have an idea to solve a problem and they know, know a lot about the market and so their solutions are very good. I, obviously, um, I'll just take it back a little bit. The idea of this interview is really to help to divulge an inventor's experiences mm. to other inventors because obviously this is a, a hard area to find information about and that's why we do this podcast so I guess this is your chance to tell your story which is great and, and share it with other, other inventors and from my perspective you know I didn't get too involved in your project but I helped I met you early in the piece and we, we guided you through the right, right paths in some areas and I was more of a manufacturing input but it's been great to see your your progress and you've done very well with it you're selling product which is fantastic thank you you've been through all the uh, stage gates and the pitfalls and the ups and downs which is really what I'd like to get out of this interview that the roller coaster ride that it is and the experience that it is it, it is really an experience it's something you won't get anywhere else and um, I guess from my perspective I really want you to sort of try and divulge uh, what you've learned out of it but but I mean for the listeners background it's it's one of the most simple projects that I've probably had through the doors mm. but even saying that how difficult has it been it is it is a very very treacherous path there's a lot to know and a lot to learn it's all you you're always out of your comfort zone so if you could just sort of enlighten the the listener on those sort of aspects of the of the project would be great sure Scott I, yeah when I started this I had absolutely no idea how difficult this was going to be and how challenging so if you're starting an invention just put your resilience cap on because uh, seriously if I had known hindsight is an amazing thing I probably if I if I'd known what I had to do to get it to market I possibly would have chickened out and not done it actually <laughs> and I, I hate to be so frank but it has been a roller coaster ride, but also a really great ride. And I'm really um, just so amazed that I've actually been able to invent something because I never thought I'd be that sort of person. So basically what happened was I was um, hit by a terrible illness and I was at home and I started a studio at home because I was having awful uh, treatment. And um, so I started getting students coming to my studio and, and of course then Sophie came along and she had braces and literally just started thinking how can I help Sophie how can I help this poor kid she's an amazing student and she's really talented and, and that's one thing people don't really realize a lot of times this is not for money uh, people do inventions to help other people which is yeah what people miss everyone who gets successful from an invention yeah everyone just thinks oh that greedy bugger you know, had the, why they go and do that, la la la. But really, when it comes down to it, all this effort and pain is usually driven by some altruistic desire to help. Yeah, well, I've never that's thought of the money. I mean, yeah. that's why I'm a, a music teacher, I guess. We, <laughs> we certainly don't, don't think about money all the time. But basically, yeah, so my brother came to visit me and he's um, done a lot of stuff with his hands. And I said to him, you know, I've got these ideas for this thing and um, can you help me? make it you know and so I gave him some rough drawings and he literally went to Bunnings you'll see this on my website he went to Bunnings and got all these funny things and a, a curtain rod 
and, and bent it to shape and then made this other sort of rough thing and so it sent it to me in the post out of pl this plastic stuff and then I worked out the right shape and um, got Sophie to try it so we made it fit over he made it fit roughly over a mouthpiece it, literally it was just getting the, the size plastic mm. that he could melt to fit over the mouthpiece <laughs> to start with and so then I sort of roughly got a better idea of the shape and then my father-in-law came over for Christmas from England and uh, he happens to be an engineer and he was, when he was um, lecturing at Loughborough University, he was a specialist in rubber. And so I said to him, well, can you help me take this to the next level? Because I know this shape works, sort of, but I've got to get the material right. So he went home after Christmas with all these other drawings I'd done and he made me all these rough prototypes out of latex and he literally made them in his garage for me and posted them to me and he was very excited to be able to help. So from there Sophie tried a whole heap more of those and some of them were terrible and you know other ones worked and the latex was far too soft and but we got the one that worked the best and um, so then I thought oh gosh what can I do now? So I think that was about when I got onto you Scott because the thing is about inventing something is there's no there's no manual if you look look up on youtube or not youtube if you look up on google you know how to invent something which i did <laughs> there's nothing there's no, absolutely nothing to tell you where to go what to do who to see so it was kind of a bit of a trial and error and so i started looking up all these um, IP lawyers because I thought maybe they would be able to help me and I found this little review of an IP lawyer in Brisbane by Scott and so then I rang Scott and got chatting to Scott about it I think that was about then uh, and in the meantime I had some, and the next prototype um, drawn up by a friend of mine who's an engineer John Chanson he's a, a friend of ours and he drew up some drawings for me for a couple of crates of beer and um, <laughs> a few bottles of red wine and a couple of dinners out and um, I chose more than that by the way oh yes <laughs> <laughs> you've been very good actually <laughs> so anyway I got the drawing done and got it 3d printed in the Gold Coast and was so excited because at this stage I had about five or six kids who were playing trumpet and we're about to give up because of the pain you know and having run many band programs over the years this ruins your whole band program you know and I was thinking oh no so I got this 3d printed and um, actually one of my students whose name was Christy she tried it and we put it on a mouthpiece and the whole thing fell apart in my hand and it had sharp edges and it was a total disaster so that was a shame and and then so what happened was we progressed from there and then I had Scott to actually guide me. So at that stage I had a manufacturer um, somewhere in Brisbane who was going to manufacture some rubber products for me, some prototypes, which he did. And then I ended up using um, food grade silicon and coming up with the final design after quite a few prototypes with the, with the silicon and the rubber. And we went with FDA approved um, silicon, that's the American um, Safety Organization. And, um, and of course, then I met Hamish through Scott. Marketing guru. Marketing guru, who's been my marketing guru ever since. And Official hand holder. <laughs> and these guys have been, actually, I must say, they have been um, invaluable in, in, in helping me. And, uh, and they haven't paid me to say that either. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, in fact, in fact, Lisa bought the bickies today. That's I did. I did. I paid for the biscuits. <laughs> and so we, with my students, I used all my students in the marketing, which was great because they were really excited to be part of this. And so I've got Connor on the box, and I've got Sophie on the box, and I've got Ben in the advertising, and it's been really almost a family affair with my studio, yeah, which has you know grown and got bigger and bigger and bigger, and. Um, you know, and it's now out there, it's just about in most of the big shops in the country and that itself has been a massive trial and error. People I think in the shops are sometimes a bit hesitant to take on a new product. So it's taken a lot of persuasion and a lot of discussions with them and um, now I'm getting some rungs on the board and I'm getting great Facebook posts coming back saying how great the product is and I'm getting some reorders and I've got some inter interest internationally now and um, I even did a lecture via Skype with Ithaca University or Ithaca College I think they are in the States and about Buzz Buddy and one at UQ in Queensland um, so yeah so it's that's kind of where I'm at now. A real experience. 
And yeah. I, I imagine that, um, like a lot of people, you don't really realise what you've learned along the path. But if you turned around and started again, you would be amazed how much knowledge you've gained. Oh, okay. How long do you think you've been going for, if you were to say from day one, when you first had Sophie? Oh, it's probably about four or five years now. Yeah, so, so overnight success, four or five years <laughs> in the baking. You've been through hell and high water, you've experimented, you've proved the principle, then you've got professional involved and you've got what you wanted. And you know, you've, you've managed to solve the problem perfectly, which is the key. The user experience is what you want, so that's the key of it. Um, so my, my hat's off. I mean, it's, it, it is amazing. You've got a long way to go as far as trying to get your sales up. You're, oh, you're, yeah. you're earning the piece that you really have started the journey as far as the sales process. But all indications are, sa are saying that you're going to be very successful with this project. And I hope you are going to be very successful. And I'm sure Thanks. with with, Matt, uh, with um, Hamish's guidance, uh, the marketing part will be, be fine for you. And now I know you've got some distribution options as well. And you're looking at broadening your horizons overseas. And that's just a great, great uh, Great um, outcome for Australia and yourself, Thanks, and, and students with the uh, with. Mm, yeah. mm, with and, I, and I think also just to just to go back a step to uh, Lisa, what what would you from like you've just said before? I mean, this is not just something that you've done over six months. This is something that's been in the uh, you know in, in your something you've been focusing on for years. What would you have done? What what have you learned? And what would you have done differently starting from from day one? Can you be more a little bit more specific about what you've learned? Just 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 for the listener benefit, because you know we've got other people listening here that are are starting out on their journey. Is there anything you can pass on to them? Look, I've learned so much. It's it's actually been a wonderful life lesson, to be quite honest. Um, I think one thing I've learned is to keep going. Mm -hmm. You know, there've been some great ups but some challenging downs and you know when people have slammed the door in your face my face when i've asked them for sales um you know i've kind of gone well i believe in my product i know my product works it works for all my students so i've kept going and i think that's something that i want to encourage you all to do if you've got an idea take it further it does cost money to get an invention out there and it was a very interesting journey with the patent pending process i think you need to actually get lots of quotes from different lawyers um, they charge a lot of money of course to get this stuff out there make sure you protect your ip um, your intellectual property really important to protect that so i've protected mine with com with various companies so that's something you need to do i didn't know that actually till i was about to get it out there and someone said if you've got a company protect your house and i went really oh okay <laughs> so i've now have two companies so i'm actually technically a ceo of two companies which is kind of fun yeah that's so, that's what we talk about building on rock yeah yeah rather than setting things up for a fall yeah exactly and things i just learned by trial and error along the way i think um you know i mean you know i'm i'm sitting here next to scott but i think scott is a great person to come to if you've got an invention because i didn't know anybody to come to who had the, that experience and i think that's the thing you know you need to to really look at how you're going to market your product how you're going to get um where, where you're going to manufacture it you know what you're going to put on the box and that's another thing i learned too was you know that the rules aren't particularly clear you know, I had plenty of lawyers wanting to charge me thousands to tell me what to put on the box. But if you look at the Australian standards, people and Choice magazine, and if you look at all the sort of consumer protection authorities around, they will give you a really good idea. And, and technically, as far as I know, you know, if you're selling a product that isn't a child product, you've got to put where it's made. But that's about it, you know. So that was really interesting, working out what we had to put on the box without paying multiple thousands of, of lawyers fees you know and so there's so a thousand branches in the road as you go along the path yeah and everyone has a critical decision yeah that's what makes it difficult mm. you've never done yeah. it before yeah you're totally out of your depth <laughs> no and i think that's that's, that's the thing i've learned from you lisa i mean is in i haven't i mean i've been in business for years but uh it, looking at the development of a single product from from the start is that it's very important to keep the initial idea of why you're doing this in the back of your mind all the time because as you go further and further into developing the product from design to manufacturing to marketing to getting sales is there are so many little things to consider which i know we've discussed over the last mm. six months which mm. is just you know to, to scott and i sometimes seem so obvious 
in, in a sense. But you know, when you're talking to wholesalers, and like we've we've had chats about this before about working with retail, I mean, all of a sudden you're thrown into a shark pool or, almost mm. because you've got this idea and you know that it's going to help someone, the end user. However, there all the, there's, there's so many little barriers that you have to get across in order to get in front of that person. Mm. Uh, so, so for you, getting a sale is helping someone, but for a retailer, getting a sale is getting money and profit margin and making sure that their uh, margin is, is big enough. So all of a sudden you're having all these different conversations and all you want to do is help someone at the end of the day. So I think that's probably what I've seen that you've learned is, is that you've got to keep in mind the idea of why you're doing it, but then also there's so many commercial aspects that you have to be aware of as well. Absolutely. And I think too, you know, I've been really lucky in that regard. You know, I had a great retailer here in, in Brisbane who I've known for a long time and used for a long time who was just so excited about the product and he's uh, Greg from Brass Music Specialist and he's been really helpful to me, you know, getting it out there. You know, he did a big big order at the start because he was so excited about it and told all his colleagues and and I think, you know, you need to get someone on board who's going to help you sell it to start with someone in, in retail, you know, and um, then the word spreads slowly. I mean, I'm in a very niche market with um, brass. And but when I say it's a very niche market, if you think of how many kids play an instrument in schools, I think it's one in five kids play an instrument in schools, you know, and if you think of how many schools are in Australia, let alone the world, you know, there's a lot of kids playing brass instruments. So it's not quite as niche as we maybe think, we may think, but yeah, it's it's getting that, it's almost a trust. You've got to build that relationship with your salespeople. And on the whole, it's been absolutely fantastic and people have been great, you know, which has been wonderful and, and really happy to help me try and establish this product because you know, I've been in this industry for 30 years and so a lot of people know me, but to have a, a new product, it's a risk to them, you know, but because they know that there's nothing else out there that does the job and this actually does the job, it helps students with braces, it helps them, you know, with the pain and uh, even Invisalign, you know, I think I, th I think that's where the trust came for, for a lot of people. They, they sort of knew that I was not just a fly-by-nighter and I wasn't doing this for the money. I mean, it helps to pay all my expenses, obviously, but I'm still not doing it for the money. I just want kids to enjoy music and I want kids, because music's just such a great part of life and arts education is, you know, should be given much more standing in, in our country than it already is, you know. And if you look at the sports funding that goes on, the government gives billions to sports funding and yet they give hardly anything to arts funding. So that's something I've learnt and I would love to see that improve. You know, I'd love to see the government actually help people like me who are small startups because I've been working seven days a week to fund this and all my colleagues and friends will tell you that, you know, and my husband who's very sick of it. But um, yeah, so, you know, it's something we really need to focus on is supporting these um, little startups. And I think that's where government grants should be a bit more proactive. Look, not, not only that, it's, it's a real frustration for me over the 20 years I've been doing this. I've always tried to get a fund together for qualified inventions. Mm. And it's one of those things that private, like there is some government assistance and, and I might even have a chat with you after mm. this podcast because, because there's probably a couple of things we could probably tap into there which I haven't talked to you about. Oh, okay. But um, there, there are some good good government programs but there, there's still a long way to go. Mm. And what, what frustrates you more is the private investors just aren't interested. And it's, it's really difficult because it it's, can be very lucrative, especially if it's you know, a qualified project and run properly. Mm. And, uh, and it's a shame that people aren't really getting behind mm. inventors. And, and, and with, I listen to your story, I think, you know, the, the great thing with you, you've got great credibility. You know, that's why probably your first retailer championed, we call it championing your product, mm -hmm. we don't get behind it and they, they sort of endorse you and all the rest of it, which is really, really nice. And, and your, mm, your, your standing in the field has probably allowed him to have that confidence in you. And so I think it's really important to tell your story as well. I was just recently in New York and we presented two very highly technical products to a, a big board of commercialization people over there and they were struggling with the concepts you know it's new we just put it in front of them they're, they're new to the world so it's you know there's a lot to get head around but what quieted the whole room down was the people the inventors were with me and they told their story of why they came up with a product and you could have heard a pin drop Mm. So you just told me the story of why you did it. Mm. I really think that needs to be on, you know, almost your first port of call when you're out there because for one, people know why you're doing it and it's for altruistic reasons. 
and they'll get behind you. Mm. People mm. want to want to help people succeed when they when they're doing it for the right reasons. You you are, and it's fantastic. And so yeah, I, I, I can't uh, you know say how how proud I am of you for what you've yeah, done. Well, it's really good, Scott. really good success. <laughs> Can I um are we? I want to wrap it up because there's two questions I like to ask. No, go your, for most, it, your most pleasurable experience through the through the whole thing, and and the least experience, least pleasurable, I guess the, the worst experience. If you could share those two things, you know that that might be interesting <laughs> for people. That's put you on the spot, hasn't it? <laughs> well, I think the most pleasurable experience is when a, a child puts on a buzz buddy onto their mouthpiece and goes, "Oh my God, it doesn't hurt anymore." I think for me, that's just for me, that's just it's really a pinnacle of my career in a lot of ways. It's just like, yeah. wow, I can actually help this child continue playing trumpet yeah. or whatever. For me, that's just makes my day. I mean, that's just so exciting. Yeah. And, you know, I've had mothers in tears and, yeah. you know, the whole thing because there are so many great parents out there. And I think that's the one thing too that um, I've found is that um, we're a, a three-part team. It's the mother, it's me, mother and father, sorry, beg your pardon, the parents me and the child it's a relationship so so when it um all comes together and their mum's buying the buzz buddy to help the child and you know it's just great i think that's wonderful yeah. and um, there are so many great supporters of music so that that to me is is fabulous probably the worst experience oh i don't know there's some i probably won't talk about <laughs> but um understandable oh just i don't know i think people not trusting you know people not wanting to take on the product because it's a bit risky i think i've had i haven't had very many actually to be quite honest only one or two shops who have felt you know mm. um well you know this is new it's untested you know who are you we don't know who you are we're not going to support you and but you're seeing both ends of the spectrum of humanity yeah the, the really positive and side there and the fearful side exactly and yeah early adopters are really hard to find unfortunately everyone wants to follow a successful product no one wants to be the pioneers. Unfortunately, this is the world we live in now. We're all risk averse. But saying that, in saying that though, 99% of the people I've approached have actually wanted to take it on because they know it's a Brisbane product. They know I'm a local person and um, an Australian person and a small business. And I think even my post office man is just so supportive. You know, he wants me to be a multi-millionaire, which of course will probably never happen and it doesn't really matter. But, you know, he's so supportive of it. And I think that to me is one of the highs as well. But yeah, it's a bit depressing when you sort of try and, you know, the sales part's really, really hard. And that's one thing I want to encourage you all to keep doing because you, for, you know, the door slammed in your face, you'll actually get more that are open to supporting you, mm -hmm. you know. But, but as I've said to you on a number of occasions though, I mean, yes, you, you're in that, uh, phase where sales is now the focus yeah and like I've always said when you called me and said you know you're a bit despondent about the numbers is look I'll, I'll always say it's a proven product you know you, you've got kids that have come to you have, were thinking about giving up playing they've used it they're now continuing on playing that's a proven product so really now it's all just about reach mm. which is getting out there getting proof collecting that the evidence which is getting getting those testimonials it's all hard slog but the more you get you know the, the more proof you can get out there the more people will believe you and the more people won't have to go well it's an untried product you can simply say well no it is it's working well and that's think, right yeah mm. exactly and that's what's starting to happen now i'm getting some really good testimonials so if you look on my facebook site you know i've had a few lovely ones recently and it's really heartening you know it's kind of exciting to see that you know that these kids are were going to give up trumpet and now they're playing and that's what and that's what it's all about i mean yeah. that that's what these products are about i mean mm. uh, people like you lisa i mean inventors live at the screaming edge if you like uh, and it's all very well to say, oh, there's a funny little product there. My, who knows how, like you just said before, you might become a multimillionaire, you might not. <laughs> I but I, I think <laughs> these are the sorts of things that push industries further. Uh, there are lots of products which become mainstream over a, a long period of time because they become accepted, but someone has actually got to start and get out there and push it forward, and then it becomes mainstream. So unfortunately, yes, you're at the screaming edge, but it, it's necessary for a lot of industries to, to actually progress and come up with better solutions for mm. whatever they're doing. Well, I know that I've come up with a better solution because there hasn't been anything like this in no, the past. No. And um, I stand, you know, often I'm, I'm, you know, feel a bit lacking confidence about things, but actually this, I feel very confident that I know that 
this actually works and I'm looking forward to, to finding the money to actually do the French horn and the trombone one. That's the next one because people are asking for that. But I feel really confident in my heart. I know that this product works and it helps kids and, and that for me is, is what makes my life so exciting. Well, you're the typical inventor. You're going through hell and high water to get the product on, on the market. You've done a really good job, and I really hope you do get rewarded for your energy. I, I think you will. Honestly, I think this is going to be one of those ones that's a silent, uh, you know, quiet achiever. And uh, you know, you're the, you're the same. You'll keep plugging it till you make it, make it. And I and I wish you all the best. Mm. Thanks. Scott. Thanks for sharing your experience. No, Thank thanks, you. Lisa, for coming in and, and telling everyone about your story. And we'll post Lisa's product. A link to her Facebook page on our Facebook page off to market so head on over there and have a look and uh, yeah if you know anyone that needs one you can buy one from her website thanks Hamish and thanks Scott and thanks for having me and for listening to my story <laughs> thank you <laughs> you've been listening to off to market with Scott Farley and Hamish Chadwick